Hello, welcome back to our lecture series for Western Civilization 101. Our topic today is Alexander the Great. Now, a few lectures back when um, you learned about the Persian and the Peloponnesian Wars, you uh, heard a little bit about a place called Macedonia or Macedon as, uh, as it was mentioned. There was a man there by the name of Philip II. Because, of course, just to give you a little refresher, during the Peloponnesian War, the Greek city-states were weakened. Um, Athens and Sparta were fighting against each other. Athens eventually, of course, loses that war. But none of the Greek city-states win in the long run. Because with a weakened Greek city-state system, uh, a northern area, that was Greek-speaking as well, but not a part of the... The, the grouping that we've been talking about with Athens and Sparta and Thebes and, and those city-states, um, Philip II was allowed and able, I should say, to come down and take over all of Greece except for the city-state of Sparta. Uh, now, Macedonia is in the, to the north of Greece, and Philip, as you will um, hear, creates uh, different new technologies and new ways with his army that will prove uh, very effective when he starts on his conquest of Greece. Now, of course, for this lecture, Philip II has a son, a very famous son, obviously, considering his name is Alexander the Great. Um, and it seems that Philip and Alexander don't exactly have a very loving, caring relationship. In fact, um, when uh, Philip is murdered or assassinated, there was rumors that Alexander, his son Alexander the Great, may have had something to do with it. Rumors, of course, that maybe the son had killed the father. But either way, Alexander will take over from his father, Philip II, and he's only in his, um, I don't know, around 20 years old. So he's a very young man when he takes over. And his father had already laid the foundation um, for, you know, the new army, the new Macedonian army uh, that was proving to be very effective. And so Alexander does take over in uh, a very strong period, a strong time in Macedonian history. Uh, you know, just a few things about the army. You probably will learn more about this. But um, what Philip had done, instead of making the army up of like mercenaries or people that you paid to be loyal to you, um, Philip, of course, uh, had a professional army. He had a professional army, and he would pay his soldiers. Um, but it was a professional, it was a very well-disciplined army. Each man... Um, had a, a servant, at, at before each person had a servant to carry his food and supplies and stuff like that, but now the fighters had to carry their own supplies. Less people move quicker, more effective, is, uh, in other words, is the, the goal for that. Uh, Philip's army did move faster. They were more efficient with all that excess baggage. Um, so that's just a few things. There were some also technology with weapons that helps with the Philip's army. So Alexander, although he's a young man, he takes over and he has a, a very well-disciplined army to use. And he does use that army quite often, as you will find out. Uh, Alexander, of course, starts off on his journey of conquest. In fact, he pretty much never spends time in his home uh, of Macedonia. He is pretty much constantly on the road, um, so much so that by the time Alexander and his men reach the Indus Valley, he'd already at this time gone through Asia Minor and conquered the uh, Persian Empire, fell to Alexander the Great. He gets Egypt. He gets all of the um, areas that we've discussed in um, past lectures. Israel, Phoenicia, um, all of that fell to Alexander the Great. By the time his army gets all the way to the Indus Valley, they want to go home. 
and we have a mutiny. Um, Alexander the Great will be forced to turn around and start making his way back toward Macedonia. <clears throat> now Alexander the Great was a, a well-educated man. In fact, I mentioned this before, but the Greek philosopher Aristotle was his tutor at one time. He was tutored in ethics and politics and sciences. But Alexander's primary interest was in military strategy. And um, as evidenced by the battles that take place, the numerous battles that take place under Alexander the Great, he was very good at it. Um, he actually also felt he was a god as well. There was a legend about um, Alexander's mother um, that um, Philip had seen his wife in bed with a serpent and sometimes um, Zeus could be portrayed as a serpent. There was a legend, a story. Either way, Alexander feels he is maybe a god. He has the legend and the, and the stories that he's fed on, obviously. Um, and so he truly feels that way. There are quite a number of cities throughout Asia in the, in the Far East, uh, throughout Asia, that are the Near East, that are named Alexandria. Um, just one that comes to mind is Egypt. There is an Alexandria right there in the Nile Delta. That's because as Alexander is moving through his conquest of the Persian Empire and the, the Near East area, um, he finds, he finds cities in his name, and he names them Alexandria. Alexander also encourages uh, a blending of cultures. He encourages his soldiers to marry into local populations. We will actually see a blending of Hellenic, which is Greek culture, and Near Eastern culture. And you'll uh, eventually get uh, learn about that. It's called Hellenistic the Hellenistic Age, as opposed to the Hellenic. Hellenic is Greece. Hellenistic is a combination of Greek culture and Near Eastern culture that is facilitated by Alexander the Great and his conquests um, of this region. So he does encourage um, the combination of this and the blending of these cultures. Now. Alexander, as you'll find out more detail, but he never makes it home. In fact, he will, um, he will die en route uh, on his return home. Uh, you'll hear more about his death and obviously his life in this upcoming lecture. But he leaves a, a great legacy in that Hellenistic age. But there is a problem. And the problem is Alexander does not designate an heir. Um, he, he does not, he, he actually says to the strongest. That is not a good idea because he has a lot of generals that are going to tell themselves, well, you know what, I am the strongest. So we're going to have um, problems after Alexander's death. There will be a, a split in his empire because some of his generals will start carving out different areas for themselves, of course, during this Hellenistic age or Hellenistic period. So Alexander the Great, very um, complex, very interesting historical figure. Let's learn more about him. Alexander the Great was the son of Philip II, the king of Macedon. Philip II was the king who conquers the Greek city-states. It's really the first time ever that the Greek city-states had all been collectively conquered by one person. Uh, the Persians made an attempt, but they weren't successful. Now, the Peloponnesian Wars fought primarily between the Spartans and the Athenians is a war that lasted such a length and was so devastating not only to the losers, the Athenians, but in many ways the Peloponnesian Wars weakened all of Greece. The Greek city-states were in a weakened state for years after the Peloponnesian Wars concluded in 404 BC. Fighting continued, in fact, 
after the Peloponnesian Wars between various city-states and the mighty empire of Persia manipulated events in Greece for several decades in the aftermath of the Peloponnesian War. Now to the north of the main Greek city-states was an area known as Macedon. Macedon is an uh, area that consisted of mountains and large plain areas, but not a whole lot of cities or urban centers, uh, much more rural sort of backwoods area in comparison to the other Greek city-states to the south. In fact, the Greek city-states to the south, the Athenians and the Spartans and the Corinthians and the Thebans viewed the Macedonians as barbarians. The Macedonians had been fighting barbarians for so long that the rest of the Greek city-states considered them barbarian themselves. Now, what happens though, because of the Peloponnesian Wars and the aftermath of the Peloponnesian Wars and the weakened state of all the Greek city-states, Macedonian power will grow and it will grow in really the, the person of Philip II who consolidates his power, uh, in some instances murders his way to the top and becomes the Macedonian king at the age of 23. And he will be a person who transforms the fighting force of Macedon into one collective unit that will overpower the Greek city-states to the south. Uh, he does this with new military techniques and you might say new technology. He uses engineers to produce new weapons. Uh, the Macedonian Greek phalanxes, the, the, the fighting forces of infantrymen, are going to be retrained to use longer pikes or spears, uh, something that they called sarissas, which were instead of nine feet long, uh, estimates have the new sarissas up to 18 feet long. That would be the equivalent of, say, a, a young child fighting against you and you holding your arm out and the young child wailing away, not able to reach you. That's what these long sarissa pikes were about with these phalanxes. The Greeks were able to hold out off uh, or reach their opponents before their opponents could reach them. But that's not the only thing. What Philip does is he revives the, the cavalry unit, the so-called companion cavalry, which were the high-ranking nobles in Macedon, which were the core of his fighting force. This companion cavalry always played a huge role in fighting, uh, sort of finishing off opposing armies. The cavalry would usually sweep in from a flank position and devastate armies after the phalanxes would begin their job. Uh, and it was a huge, this uh, factor of having the cavalry unit come in on the flank position in addition to the, uh, in, in addition to the infantry, the, the phalanx fighting forces with those long spears, uh, that proved to be decisive in battles for Philip II. But it wasn't only that. Uh, you did have bows and arrows, but the bows and arrows were restricted in the, the force that they could provide based on one's arm strength. Philip will create what's known as belly shooters, where you can actually pull against your belly with both arms, creating more force. Philip's engineers also created a standing, uh, sort of like a standing belly shooter in the device known as the torsion catapult, where they would be able to crank up tension uh, to shoot a spear or to shoot an object, uh, some say at a distance of almost a quarter of a mile that would be able to penetrate armor from a quarter of a mile away. In fact, the word catapult is associated with skin piercing. The word pelt in catapult refers to that. Uh, and it could be done, again, distances that were astounding to the other side. Um, some of these catapult devices were used, were used in siege warfare, which Philip and Alexander the Great, his son, will be able to use effectively 
uh, more effectively really than anyone else uh, prior to this time. Cities, of course, were surrounded at this time. Most of them were surrounded by walls that created the obvious obstacle uh, to armies that a wall would have. But if you can somehow knock down the wall or penetrate the wall uh, and your army get inside, even in a crack, uh, that would prove to be deadly for the residents who might have walled themselves in or the army who may have walled themselves in. Uh, Philip's devices with these catapults and with siege towers and wheeled towers that he ends up creating will be uh, an element that will be introduced into warfare that will be unstoppable for both Philip and his son Alexander the Great. Now Philip will move down out of Macedon and, and take over all of the, or most of the Greek city-states to the south. Uh, there will be a decisive battle th that Philip will engage in with his young son, who's 18 at the time, who will lead a cavalry unit of companions. Alexander the Great is um, a child prodigy to some, uh, in the fact of his intelligence and his uh, horsemanship ability and his general sense of, uh, of military expertise uh, growing up as a teenager uh, in the military ranks under his father. And he will play a large role with Philip at a key battle against the Greek city-states. Uh, one of the problems with the Greek city-states is that they weren't united. They weren't uh, a unified fighting force. They were all separate independent cities they were like their own little mini countries in effect. Um, and that's going to be an advantage for Philip as he comes down against the Greeks, the fact that they're not a united fighting force. Now the Greeks, some of the Greek city-states do act as a, as a fighting force allying with one another, but by the time Philip moves down to a certain point, it's really too late. The Athenians and the Thebians are going to unite to try to stop Philip and there will be a key battle at the Battle of Chaeronea in 338 BC. And this battle will be a significant uh, victory for the Macedonian general, uh, effectively creating his ownership over the Greek city-states. Now. What Philip does is he consolidates the Greek city-states into one league, what he calls the League of Corinth. Now, he effectively is the king of the Greeks, but he doesn't portray himself as the king of the Greeks, and he doesn't force his way on the Greek city-states. In fact, what he tells the Greeks after, he, they conquer, after the Greeks are conquered is they can all go home and things are pretty much the same as, as they were. Uh, you can have your democracy, Athens. Uh, you can have your oligarchy, Corinth. You can have whatever form of government and in whatever way you ruled yourself, you can keep it. But you can't change your government without getting approval from me, and you can't go to war with anyone, uh, even another Greek city-state, uh, either, and you also are going to supply what I might need, but everything else is pretty much going to remain the same. He doesn't destroy the place, he doesn't uh, try to force his monarchy and his system of government on these Greek city-states that had all done things on their own independently for years. So this League of Corinth is created. That League of Corinth and the resources that he has will allow Philip II to pursue a larger goal and that is the invasion of Persia. The Persian Empire at this time is still the largest empire that the world had ever seen, the largest and richest empire in the world. Uh, the Persians had gotten their nose bloodied a couple of times by trying to invade Greece, the famous uh, Battle of Marathon in which they went after Athens, after Athens helped out an Ionian Greek city-state in a rebellion, and then in the second invasion, 
the famous stand of the 300 Spartans at the Battle of Thermopylae and the naval battle of Salamis. Uh, and the Greeks are, uh, excuse me, the Persians are finally going to be sent packing after the Battle of Plataea in that second invasion. Uh, but still, the, Gre the Persians were the largest empire in the world. That's what Philip had his eyes on. But before he can launch an invasion of the Persian Empire, supposedly he wanted to avenge the earlier invasions that the Persians had done against the Greeks, but that was 150 years before. Uh, prior to leading that invasion, Philip will be assassinated at a ceremony. Uh, it, was a, he was the, it was a wedding that was taking place of one of his daughters, and he was assassinated at that event by one of his bodyguards. Uh, and no one knows exactly what the assassination, whether how far the conspiracy went or whether it was someone who was possibly paid by the Persians to, to knock off Philip II because they knew he may be a threat. Uh, there's also one of his wives who was the mother of Alexander the Great that could have played a role into the assassination of Philip II. Uh, Olympias was uh, the mother of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, uh, the son of Olympias and Philip II, was actually half Macedonian because Olympias was actually not from Macedonia but from another area, Greek area, to the north. Now, when Philip II is assassinated at the age of 46, his son Philip, excuse me, his son Alexander, who will now become Alexander III of Macedon, King of Macedon, and he is only 20 years old at the time. And because of his age, uh, some of the Greek city-states will immediately rebel against his rule, uh, and there's also going to be others who might attempt to gain the monarchy for themselves that may have been a high-ranking official within the, uh, within the army that uh, Philip had created, within the nobility ranks of Macedon. Uh, Alexander the Great will quickly, very decisively, put down the rebellions and gain his leadership role as the king of Macedon and as the ruler of the Greek city-states through the League of Corinth. Uh, he, there is one city-state, Thebes, that rebels against Alexander the Great, and Alexander will ruthlessly put down that rebellion, and after, the Thebe, after Thebes refuses to surrender to him, he will pretty much wipe the city off the map, killing all of the male inhabitants and selling the rest, perhaps 30,000, uh, into slavery. And once he did that, uh, the other Greek city-states pretty much did whatever uh, Alexander said, and Greece was under control. And once Greece and Macedonia were under control by Alexander, he is going to pick up where his father left off with his dream and invade the Persian Empire. Uh, this invasion of Persia begins in 334 BC. Uh, Alexander has to cross the Hellespont, which is the waterway that separates Europe and Asia. He crosses over that with his army. Uh, perhaps the, the estimates are between 37 and, and 45,000. Uh, he's got a cavalry unit of about 5,000 when he crosses over. Alexander the Great had grown up uh, as a student of Aristotle, uh, something that Philip paid Aristotle to come up to Macedonia to, to tutor his son, and also a, a, not only a student of, of Aristotle in philosophy, but uh, in, in history and of a curiosity of, of, of the earth in, in some respects, a curiosity of the world. Alexander wanted to conquer the world in order to know more about the world. And it is also said that he was fascinated throughout his childhood with the stories that most of the Greeks were, or 
had grown up with, and those are, of course, the stories of Homer in the Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, in many ways the foundation of the Greek religion. Uh, and, of course, in the Iliad, the, the hero, the, the Greek hero of that story, Achilles, it was said that Alexander was a descendant of Achilles, and uh, he slept with the Iliad, uh, and he read it daily, and the heroic exploits of Achilles. Uh, he will go into the Persian Empire with leading this army against the largest empire in the world. And the Persians must have been shocked by the fact that the Greeks were coming over. After all, they were the largest empire in the world. And they had rebellions that they had to deal with. And they were bloodied by, you know, they got their nose bloodied by the Greeks before, but that was because they went to them. But to have an army invade their empire, which was the largest in the world, was something that wasn't done, but Alexander does it. Now, the first major battle between the Persians and Alexander will be at the Battle of the Granacus River, and this is in 334 BC. Uh, there's a riverbed there, not this is in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, where this battle takes place. Uh, in, in order to, you know, of course, the, the army has to get across this river, but on the other side, the Persian army is going to meet Alexander to try to check his position at that point, to try to stop him just as he's getting into the Persian Empire. And they amass an army maybe of about 50,000, 60,000 on the opposite bank of the Granacus River. So Alexander's troops have to cross the river and then up a steep embankment to where the Persian army uh, was located. And you might say uh, this, is not a, this is not a favorable advantage at all for, uh, for Alexander's troops. They're on the low ground. The Persians are on the high ground. And it was a pretty bold move. Uh, some in high-ranking uh, generals in his army uh, advised that Alexander shouldn't make this move across this river, not only having to get across the swift waters of the Granacus River, but then up the steep embankment. This uh, battle will be a hard-fought battle. They have to get across the river, uh, the cavalry unit and so forth, but the cavalry unit of Alexander does cross a little bit downriver, and they're able to, to come in uh, not directly across the river and up the steep embankment and push back uh, just enough against the Persians in, in order to allow the Macedonian forces to, to get up that embankment and then to fight um, against the Persians, which they do, and they do successfully. Uh, this battle uh, will show the Persians that Alexander the Great and the Macedonians mean business. If they're willing to attack across the river and up a steep embankment, then the boldness and the uh, fighting ability that the Macedonians have is something that the Persians are going to have to reckon with. Now, Alexander will continue to make his way down through Asia Minor, uh, going along the coast and then back inland. Uh, one of the, the problems that Alexander has is he doesn't really have much of a fleet of ships. The Persians do. Uh, they, being the largest empire in the world, have a large fleet of ships that they've been using really since the time that they had conquered the Phoenicians, uh, the Phoenicians being the famous shipbuilders in the ancient world, uh, their fleet largely came from them, and they were able to control the coastline of the Mediterranean, the eastern Mediterranean, through access uh, through these port cities that they had been built up. Now, Alexander doesn't have uh, a navy like the Persians have or a fleet of ships like the Persians have. Uh, and he's going to have to move his way to the coast. His strategy is, since I don't have a fleet, what I'll do is I'll destroy the, the port cities. I will take over the port cities, and then the fleets won't have a place to rest. Uh, I will control the seacoast, not by the ocean, 
but from the land. And that is the strategy that Alexander will have as he works his way down the coastline of Asia Minor. Now, the king of Persia at this time is Darius III. And Darius, after the Battle of the Granicus River, the Granicus River, uh, Darius is going to take personal charge of the Persian army. And he will move in uh, in a location that's near the coastline against Alexander. And this will be in 333 BC. Now, he has a fighting force, uh, uh, Darius does, of a probably two to three times the size that Alexander has. And they're going to meet in a battle at, known as the Battle of Isseus. And the Battle of Isseus will occur between the, uh, an inlet there on the Mediterranean Sea and some coastal mountains. And it, the fact that it, they're sort of hemmed in between the coastal mountains and the sea will cancel out the numerical advantage that the Persians have that Darius has at this point. Uh, and it really means, as far as Alexander is concerned, that his troops won't be able to be surrounded by the Persian forces. Now, uh, this battle of Isseus will uh, be a key battle for, for Alexander uh, in which the cavalry unit plays a, a large role. Uh, it's, a, it's a hard fought battle. The, the infantry, the, the phalanxes are uh, to some extent are having a problem at this battle because of the uneven ground. It's hard for the phalanxes to hold their position in their tight formations, which is necessary. Uh, but Alexander's use of the cavalry here will play a decisive role in yet another victory for Alexander against forces that are led directly by the king of Persia, Darius. Now, what Alexander does is he goes directly after Darius in this battle. He sees where he is, he moves his cavalry forces at Darius, uh, Darius, Darius, it depends on how you, uh, 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 whatever pronunciation might be used for the, for the Persian king. But the, uh, Alexander the Great moves his cavalry forces straight after uh, Darius, and Darius is going to flee the, the battlefield eventually, just turn his chariot around and, and get out of there before he himself is, is captured or killed. What Alexander the Great wanted to do, uh, likely wanted to do with Darius, is to, is to capture him and then force the king to be under him, uh, not to kill the king or to get rid of the king, but to keep Darius around. Uh, that would probably allow him to effectively rule the Persian Empire more effectively um, by having Darius under him. And of course this would be a forced position for, for the Persian king. But that was the intent of, uh, the, of Alexander the Great. Uh, but Darius does get away. He actually leaves behind his royal family, his mother uh, is, and his wife, and his royal court is left behind, and that royal court will be captured by Alexander the Great's forces. Uh, the Persians are traveling in these very, the, the royal family does, in these various, uh, in these very luxurious uh, arrangements with these uh, elaborate tents uh, that would follow wherever the king went. And these elaborate tents and the luxury and the, the, the gold and so forth in, these, in, in this location at Isseus was captured. And the king, though, gets away and most of his army uh, does get away, but what the Battle of Isseus does for Alexander, it, is allo it allows him to pursue further down the coast into the Persian Empire, uh, along the coast of Palestine into the 
fortified cities along the coast, taking over these port cities one by one. Um, Tyre is a city, a port city, controlled by the, controlled by the Persians. Uh, this city of Tyre is actually the, the main portion of the city is an island off the coast, uh, more than a half mile off the coastline. And of course, that fortifies the city uh, from invaders. The city also has a wall around it, and Alexander doesn't have a fleet of ships to, to go up against this city of Tyre. Um, what he does, he first of all, he sends over, he, his troops are mounted offshore uh, from this island city in what's known as the Siege of Tyre. He will send a couple of his envoys over to the island uh, to ask the residents of Tyre uh, to surrender. And Alexander gets his response when he sees the, the envoys' bodies uh, tossed over the wall uh, into the sea and dead. Um, Alexander at this point uh, knows that in order to conquer Tyre, he's going to have to go after the city in some way. And what he does is he gets his engineers to construct a, a causeway, a bridge, out from the shoreline to the city of Tyre. Uh, it's an effort that lasts seven months, the, the siege of Tyre. He'll be able to make it all the way to the island. By that time, he does have the use of some ships and the combination of this bridge, siege equipment brought, siege towers brought along uh, the bridge. Uh, Alexander will finally, after he lays siege to Tyre, conquer the city of Tyre. Uh, the residents there, since they refuse to surrender, uh, the male residents will be killed to the tune of about 6,000 and the rest, perhaps 30,000 uh, women and children, sold off into slavery. Um, he works his way down the coast. There's another city in, in a similar circumstance, Gaza, that will be also uh, laid siege to and conquered. And once he has those cities along the coast, he eliminates some of the effect that the Persians have with their naval force. Alexander will then be able to ride into Egypt that the Persians control. And when he gets into Egypt, he's pretty much welcomed by the Egyptians as a liberator. The Egyptians don't like being ruled over by the Persians, and they had rebelled against the Persians previously. Uh, so they do welcome in Alexander the Great, the, the priest in the Egyptian religion, will name Alexander to be the son of Amon uh, and the pharaoh of Egypt. So this Macedon Greek uh, king becomes the king of Egypt as the pharaoh. And with, the, with that position, you also become a god. You're a king and a god at the same time. Uh, the Egyptians believed it was the pharaoh, for example, who allowed the Nile River to gradually and predictably flood every year, uh, which allowed for crop production. Uh, in many ways, the Egyptian coastline, or not the coastline, but the river beds along the, the Nile River was uh, the breadbasket for the Mediterranean world for years, producing uh, quantities of wheat that could feed the Mediterranean world. And that's why, to a large extent, Egypt was so valuable as a, as a conquered territory and as a resource to the, you know, the Assyrians before and, uh, and then the Persians and the Greeks and eventually the Romans. Uh, now, once he is in Alexander, uh, excuse me, in Egypt, he becomes the pharaoh, and he is going to establish a, a new city at the mouth of the Nile River. Now, traditionally, Egyptian capitals had been downriver, uh, or at least at the point where the river fans off in the delta, branches off and empties into the Mediterranean, but never on the coastline. Uh, cities in the ancient world didn't like being right on the coast because of the vulnerability that the cities might have towards sea, ra sea raiders. But uh, he will establish a coastal 
a, a city along the mouth of the Nile River, but on the Mediterranean coast. The city of Alexandria, Egypt, becomes one of the most important cities in antiquity uh, and one of the most important cities today in the Mediterranean world. Of course, it will house the largest library in the world and it will have that famous lighthouse in ancient times as well, uh, one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. Now, uh, this city on the mouth of the Nile River opens Egypt up to much more Mediterranean trade than uh, Egypt ever had before. Now, after Egypt, uh, Darius is going to realize that uh, he has lost the big chunk of his empire, that whole western coastline of his empire from Asia Minor all the way down to Egypt has been shaved off by Alexander and reportedly uh, Darius is going to send envoys to Alexander the Great uh, allowing him to keep that portion of the empire that he's already taken and, and possibly to marry uh, uh, one of his daughters. Uh, and what that would do for Alexander, it would put him in a position under the king of Persia, who, who still had the big chunk of the empire. And Alexander is going to refuse this, uh, this offer, and, and fight on. And, uh, he wants it all, and, it's, and as far as Alexander is concerned, uh, Darius is the one that's not in the position to negotiate. Uh, if there's anyone who's going to dictate who has what, uh, Alexander says it's going to be him. Uh, from this point, and this is by the time we get to this point in Egypt, he spends the, the winter of 33 and 30, or 32 uh, in, in Egypt and then works his way toward the heart of the Persian Empire, going back through Palestine, back through Syria, uh, crossing into Mesopotamia, uh, over the Euphrates River, over the Tigris River, and at this point Darius to some extent is luring him in onto a, a battlefield that is to the advantage of Darius. In, in other words, the, the numbers that the Persians are going to have could be fully uh, implemented on a, a much wider, flatter uh, field of battle. And Darius is going to lead or, or to, to lure Alexander into that battlefield. And the famous battle of Gaugamela or Gaugamela is going to take place in 30, uh, 331 BC. And this is the decisive battle. Uh, Darius had been building up this force ever since the Battle of Isseus that occurred almost two years before. And some estimates have the Persian side of up to 500,000. It's, it's difficult to know uh, exactly how many troops there were, but we do know that the that Alexander the Great will be outnumbered in the neighborhood of at least three to four, in some estimates all the way up to ten to one. Um, when they get to this battle scene, when Alexander's men get to this site, they realize, uh, you know, some of his scouts are sent out and they're just stunned by the numbers that the Persians have gathered uh, for this fighting force. Uh, not only that, uh, Darius had contracted to build uh, hundreds of these war chariots uh, that were uh, constructed specifically to meet up with Alexandria, uh, Alexander. I mean, these war chariots uh, were the, the very impressive sights. The, the wheels on the war chariots actually had these blades that came out the, and the sharp point of the, the blade, uh, if you had like knives sticking out from the wheels as the horse moved along, uh, you had these spinning blades outside of the, the chariot wheels. Speci these were specifically uh, manufactured for, uh, to meet up with uh, Alexander's forces. Uh, his men who scouted out the Persians 
came back to Alexander and said, look, if we're going to attack and we're going to move, we should do it at night because the, the main factor of doing it at night is just simply if the, if the Greeks start to move toward the Persians, the sheer numbers of Persians, uh, it will be difficult to move the fighting force uh, into the Persians because they will feel so completely outnumbered and overwhelmed before they even start fighting. So the, the advice by some of the scouts was what they should do is attack at night and then they wouldn't know how outnumbered they were. Uh, and reportedly, uh, Alexander the Great didn't, you know, he said he didn't want to, he didn't want to attack at night because he didn't want to steal this victory as if it was, uh, it was cheating to attack at night. Uh, now the Persian forces, it was said, actually thought that that would happen. They predicted that the Greeks would attack, the Macedonian Greeks would attack at night, and reportedly uh, Darius kept his troops up all night uh, in anticipation for this. Now Alexander was worried going into this battle, but he, he stays up uh, planning it out, and then once it is said once he gets it in his head what he's going to do for a strategy, he uh, falls asleep. He felt good. He felt relieved once he, he comes up with a plan. He goes, okay, I got it, and then he goes to sleep. In fact, he sleeps the next morning, and is, you know, he keeps sleeping, and you know, the, the, the other generals finally have to go wake him, and he wakes up, and he's completely confident, which usually was the case. The, the confidence factor uh, is very high for Alexander. It's part of his, you know, part of uh, his, and not his strategy, is part of who he is in, in order to create these uh, victories. Uh, his confidence, his uh, decision-making abilities, his adaptability to the terrain, um, the, the fact that he adapts to changes on the battlefield. Uh, he's also very good at surveying the topography of the battlefield, making his plan based on that topography, and then readjusting as things go along much like a football coach might have to readjust his strategy in a football game as uh, the game goes on. He might have to readjust after a quarter or after a half in order to uh, execute the game plan in a different way. Um, Alexander was very good at adapting and then making a decision and then executing on that decision. And, and he did it very quickly and decisively, which resulted in decisive victories. Um, this clash in November of 331 BC on the battlefield at Gaugamela uh, will be the decisive battle between Alexander and Darius. Uh, what happens, even though they're outnumbered, uh, the strategy of Alexander will work out. He's looking for a hole, he's looking for a gap in the line for his cavalry to shoot through, uh, to break through, and to some extent Alexander will use his cavalry in order to create that little bitty gap, sort of stretching out the lines, trying to create a hole in the Persian line just enough for the, for the cavalry to shoot through, and uh, that strategy is going to work. It's still a, uh, a hard-fought victory, but that little gap enables the cavalry to go straight after the main force. Darius sat in his chariot in a centered position. Alexander fought at the, instead of in, the, in this centered position, sort of back from the front lines. Alexander fought at the front of the line. Part of what made Alexander's men follow him was the fact that he fought right next to them right in the front of the battle. Uh, Alexander would be wounded quite seriously on uh, some occasions and wounded at least eight times in battle uh, because of how he fought, leading his cavalry, uh, or even leading his infantry, depending on what battle. Now, he goes straight after Darius again um, in this battle, and Darius is going to be forced to flee again 
the field of battle. Uh, and he knows, Darius knows that this is it, that their backs are against the wall, this battle is for the very survival of the Persian Empire that was created, backed by Cyrus the Great uh, centuries before, and this is the key battle uh, for that empire. And he flees the battlefield, and he, he can't even get his chariot turned around because of the number of dead bodies. It is said that he finds a horse, he hops on the horse, and he and some of his bodyguards are able to get away. He says that he's going further to the east to try to raise another army. Um, Alexander pursues him, and then uh, Alexander has to turn around because some of the fighting force in the battle itself uh, finds that they need help against the Persians. The, uh, the Persians are actually uh, doing a number on one of the, in the center line for, for, uh, against the Macedonians at this point, and Alexander has to turn around to, to go and shore up that center for the Macedonians. And after the battle, Darius, uh, I should say Alexander, is going to pursue Darius, and he pursues him into the dark, and Darius is going to get away, uh, just like he did at the Battle of Isseus. But this uh, battle is going to weaken the Persian army tremendously. The Persian king is on the run, and the door will be open for Alexander to strike at the heart of the empire, and that's exactly what Alexander does. After the Battle of Gaugamela, uh, Alexander goes into Babylon, uh, the other main capital cities of Susa, and the main city of Persepolis, which is where the treasury for the Persian Empire was located, and uh, he, the treasury to the Persian Empire falls to Alexander in those major capital cities fall to Alexander. Darius is going to be killed by his own men uh, in the months after the Battle of Gaugamela. It's not something that Alexander really wanted to happen because he thought that that Darius would actually be more effective alive and ruling under him. That's how he, as a foreigner from Greece, really from a whole other continent, would be able to rule over this Persian Empire uh, where he didn't speak the language and had you know, different religions, different customs. What Alexander does do in order to try and rule over this empire, once that Darius is gone and once he has the capital cities and the treasury, Alexander then takes a hold of the office and the title of the great king of Persia. And what he does to try to rule over effectively the empire is to adopt Persian methods uh, in style, uh, the way that he would dress, the fact that he would put on a, a, a ring to signify his marriage to the empire and his, uh, his rule, the ceremonial aspect of the Persian king to some extent would be adopted by this Macedonian, uh, Alexander the Great. Uh, this may have been effective as far as the Persians were concerned. It's not really something that his men liked that much. Uh, they didn't want to bow down or, or kiss the hand or the, the ring of Alexander the Great. That's not what uh, the Macedonians or the Greeks uh, ever did before, uh, but it is something that uh, Alexander will require uh, during a time in which he's trying to push forward his position as the, the king of the Persian Empire. Now, Alexander is, once he establishes his control, and effectively the Persian Empire becomes the empire of Alexander the Great, uh, he will continue to pursue and expand the empire further to the east. Um, another thing that he does as the administrator of the empire he not only adopts Persian method, he takes a Persian wife, the daughter of uh, Darius that was offered to him previously. Um, he will marry uh, three times, not as many times as his father. His father had seven wives. 
many of those diplomatic marriages and the same would be done by Alexander in order to connect his bloodline to the bloodline of the Persians, connecting his royal family to the royal family of the Persians. Uh, he marries the daughter of Darius, also the daughter of a, a Bactrian princess or king in order to connect himself with that area as well. But, and he also encourages his men to take Persian noble wives as well. And, uh, reportedly, there was this massive ceremony of 10,000 of his men that, uh, that Alexander presided over a, a mass marriage of Macedonians with, with, uh, with Persians. Uh, these marriages weren't, uh, m most of these marriages were not anything that lasted uh, beyond the ceremony, but it was something that Alexander did do, and again, to try to fuse the Greek and the in the Persian culture together. Uh, Alexander is not someone that's going to be happy simply ruling over uh, an empire sitting uh, in one location, uh, even if it might be a palace, and ruling over the empire. Uh, he is a conqueror. He is someone who is not happy unless he's uh, expanding. Uh, look, just like someone might not be happy if, you know, for example, if you have a, a chain of, uh, of fast food restaurants, uh, someone building one restaurant after another and expanding it across the whole country or across the whole world, uh, that same person might not be very happy running one of those restaurants or even very good at running one restaurant. Uh, they are good and driven by the, the expansion in numbers. And, and to some extent, that's what Alexander, since he was, was he was, uh, he was someone who kept building and expanding. And he continued his fight out to the east, uh, moving deeper into the unknown world in some respects. He, he wanted to get uh, into the unknown world to find, to know the unknown uh, to some extent. And there's not a lot of information that these people had uh, at this time about the area in the subcontinent of Asia, uh, India, uh, beyond the, the foothills of the Himalaya Mountains. And um, that's where Alexander wanted to get to. Uh, he will move in that direction. The Battle of uh, the Hydaspes River takes place in 326. This is a key battle uh, over King Pontus in that uh, in that area that's in modern day Afghanistan and that allows him to pursue his goal of going into India. But what happens at this point, not long after that key battle uh, at the Hydaspes River, uh, his men are just going to say, that's it, we're not going anymore, we're not going beyond this river and into this area that is unknown. Uh, we basically want to go home. We crossed over the Hellespont eight years ago and we've gone 10,000 miles and we've been fighting ever since. We want to go home. And Alexander is going to be forced to, to turn back. He turns back toward the heart of the Persian Empire, gets back to Babylon, and uh, not long after he gets back, uh, in 323 B.C., Alexander, uh, one month shy of his 33rd birthday, he's just 32 years old, uh, he will come down with what you might call intemperance, uh, possibly alcohol poisoning, but no one will ever know. Uh, it will be an illness that goes on for about 10 to 12 days before he finally dies, and that's the end of Alexander the Great. But the empire that he creates is, uh, is still there for the Greeks and the Macedonian generals under him. And fighting, since he doesn't have heirs, he doesn't have children or at least old enough to become the heir, his generals are going to fight it out. Alexander never says who is going to take over for him. Uh, it will end up being a fight to see who will control the empire of Alexander the Great that has just been established. Um, the fighting will go on for three or four decades before 
generals will each carve up a portion of the empire in what becomes known as the Hellenistic kingdoms of Asia. Um, you'll have one general who takes over in Egypt, another general who takes over in the heart of Persia, another one who will take over in Macedonia, and another one who will take over in Asia Minor. And these Hellenistic kingdoms will be monarchies that will rule uh, into uh, the next several centuries until the Romans finally come a knock and later on. But uh, Alexander the Great, uh, his death, uh, some say possibly he was poisoned, but by the fact that he lingered for so long, uh, there wouldn't be a poison that would act in such a way, um, at, at least at that time. Um, the speculation, though, of course, does continue and some say that uh, the, the legacy that he leaves behind, even though he only lives to 32 years old, uh, will change that part of the world, uh, which becomes much more Hellenistic or Greek-like, uh, which provides a foundation for Western civilization. All right, very fascinating um, learning about Alexander the Great. Well, when we come back for our next lecture, of course, this is the Hellenistic Age, and we'll find out about um, the difference between the Hellenic, because we've learned a lot about the philosophy and, and the religion and such, the politics of the Hellenic Age, and we'll find out how this changes after Alexander the Great sweeps through the Near East. Until next time.